You know, I think one of the reasons for, for Venom's great popularity, and there are many reasons, but one of the reasons, I think, is he's so unique. There's really never been a villain like Venom because he's somebody who can take over a person's personality. Well, we've seen that happen before with hypnotists and things of that sort, but we've never seen it happen visually where another type of being literally flows over the person and becomes the person and changes the person. Visually, Venom is a great character, and the way Venom does what he does is so startlingly exciting when you look at it that he has to be one of the most unique and one of the most scary villains of all time. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Spitting Venom, a.k.a. The Venom Vlog, and this is our special Season 3 beginner, I guess you could call it. It's like a precursor for what's coming up on Season 3. And what we're going to do in this episode is we're going to go back in time. Uh, much like in the 90s, I think it was like 1997, Marvel did these books, as you can see down here. We're going to try this new format. I'd love to hear your guys' feedback on it. If you like it or not, let me know down in the comments. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to check out this issue called Venom, Seed of Darkness. It's Venom Minus One. came out in July of, uh, or that was like the uh, initial date for it, uh, in 1997, and this is part of Marvel's flashback. And what they did was they basically were like, hey, let's go back to before these characters were, were the heroes and villains that we know them to be, and let's actually explore them, um, you know, before they got their powers, or before they had their big monumental moment to make them realize they need to do something different in their life. And, uh, and this is pretty cool. And so what they did was they had Stan Lee actually narrate these. And as you can see here, it's kind of a lot of these they did had like a lot of fun with. They made them really campy and, uh, you know, really fun. They did like Spider-Man when he was like a kid. He went fishing with his Uncle Ben and they ran into like some monsters in the lake, you know, something like that. And I think they did a story with Ghost Rider where like they you found out that uh, Ghost Rider's mom, Dan Ketch's mom, who also is Johnny Blaze's mom, uh, Barbara Ketch, she became the Ghost Rider before her sons did. Uh, so it was pretty cool. And it shows how the motorcycle with the power uh, and everything ended up in the graveyard where Dan Ketch found it in issue one of Ghost Rider. So it was kind of a way to go back and just ex explore a few things. And a lot of the writers that they got to write them were people that were currently working on the books. Uh, but except for this one, I think Len Kaminsky, I think he did a couple books for Venom, uh, but he wasn't like the main writer at this time. I think Larry Hama or someone was around this time when this came out. But what they did was they go and they would show you like Stan Lee would do an intro and he'd be like, hey, true believers, guess what's happening? You know, we got a tale uh, that you won't believe, a tale to astonish, you know, and he would like go into his whole rant and ramble for like a panel or two. And uh, it was really good i really liked uh, that this this run and this stuff that they did i think the minus one spider-man one was one of my favorite ones for sensational spider-man because i think mike Rowingo did the cover and maybe the interior art too and they had like a really nice image of stan and he was like talking it was it was a really cool drawing um so in this one what we're gonna do is we're gonna flip through the book together and i probably won't show every page but i'll just show a couple of them and i'll kind of give you the broad strokes of the storyline uh so we can go over it and you can kind of see the artwork from a different angle i notice a lot of youtubers out there now they make videos where they just show their you know, the camera set up and it's looking at the, the book and you don't really see who you're talking to. And I always like that personal touch. It's always been my thing on the show was if I'm going to do a show, I want people to see me. I want them to be able to look me in the eyes when I tell them stories, you know, and that kind of thing. And it just makes it more personal. And I, you know, I know I don't have a, I have a face for radio. So I know it's not pleasant for a lot of you guys, uh, you know, <laughs> to stare at me all the time. So I figured I would try this kind of blending both worlds out there because I do kind of like that format of seeing this, but I also like seeing the reaction on the face of the person looking at it. So so uh, I'm going to try this format. I'd love to hear what you guys think. We have my webcam on looking at me here, and I got my phone recording down here. So you can see it all. I'll sync them up. They should look good together. Um, but you have uh, – in this storyline, we go back to before Eddie Brock – you know, was essentially Eddie Brock in a way, or before he was Venom, for sure. And in this story, he's working for the Daily Globe. A lot of people weren't sure about that in the movie. In the in the comic books, he did work for the Daily Globe, not the Daily Planet, uh, or the Daily Bugle. I'd, certainly not the Daily Planet. That's uh, DC, obviously. But the Daily Bugle, uh, which is where Spider-Man worked. They, I know they tweaked it in, like, the, the, the Sam Raimi movies and stuff. But in this one, no. Daily Globe, always. Uh, that's how he's always been in the comic books. And in this one, he's uh, on to a story. And he, he talks about it in the beginning – 
saying, I know the truth about, uh, you know, this creature, and I, I had this experience, and ever since I've had this experience, it's been weird. I've been looking at people differently. I feel like the shadows are closing in on me. I know too much, maybe more than a human should know, and he's, like, on this quest, and it's starting to make him crack a little bit. You can kind of see that maybe he was a decent guy at one point. And maybe getting on this case kind of, you know, turned him a little bit and made him a little bit more, you know, paranoid and a little bit more, you know, freaked out at stuff. Um, and he has an idol that he talks about uh, named Karlchik, I think, in this. And uh, so we're going to meet him soon. But uh, Eddie Brock had an idol, and uh, that idol turns on Eddie, kind of. And so you kind of see Eddie starting to get that rejection theme that we've always talked about, where his father kind of rejected him. Uh, you know, the suit felt rejected when it left Spider-Man, and, uh, and, and Eddie felt rejected by the city of New York, and that's kind of why they bonded because they, you know, they were both kind of, you know, outcasts or losers in a way, and they both kind of wanted revenge on the same person. Uh, so in this one, this is, you know, before all that, and you have Eddie here talking about Crowbar, the abyss that walked. Uh, and like I said, this is uh, Len Kaminsky who wrote it, and James Fry the Third who did the pencils, Chris Ivey on inks. Uh, really great team on this. Actually, this book looks pretty good. I know a lot of you are going to say, oh, Eddie Brock doesn't really look like Eddie Brock. Well, this is before he started working out a bunch, before he started pumping iron. Uh, he's, he's in shape, for sure. He's definitely an in-shape guy, but he's not, you know, ripped. He's not a big dude. Uh, but in this, we also uh, meet this doctor, and I'm going to look over. His name is Nigel Don Levy. I think his name is. I can't really read too much. I have, I'm too far away from the book. But yeah, it's like something Don Levy, I think. Uh, PhD. Uh, he's got this big uh, machine he's working on. He's a scientist. Uh, and he's like, I think outside Jersey somewhere. I think he's somewhere pretty close to where Eddie Brock can get to him because obviously Eddie Brock's in New York City. And, uh, and he has this device and he opens up this rift in space and time. And uh, what happens is this creature comes through named Crowba. And Crowbot comes in and is like, he's like this big, you know, amoeba basically made of darkness. And he, you know, he's like, I've lived in the dark reaches of space. I'm from a planet and I want to, you know, basically, you know, you have something I need, which is form and substance. So I'm going to basically bond with you and, 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 you know, mutate with you, almost like a symbiote in a way. Um, and so what he does is he, he's actually telling, as he's chasing the guy, he's like, hey, don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. I, ne I need you in one piece. And, uh, and, you know, Don Levy's like, no, get away from me. You're a monster. This is not what I wanted. And then so... So this uh, crowbar key, uh, creature bonds with him and then, you know, mutates with them. And then at this point, that's when Eddie Brock starts getting these weird calls. And he's like, you know, wants to get on this case. Uh, he wants to find out what's going on about Crowbar and Don Levy and everything that's going on. And he has a, maybe a source and it could come from his idol. But his idol is kind of like everyone in the building. They all hate uh, Carl Check, this guy that uh, Eddie Brock looks up to here. He says, hey, you used to be a good writer and everybody looks up to you. Uh, but now you're kind of the laughing stock. Everyone calls you a lush. They make fun of you because you go to bars and drink because whatever, you know, years of doing this job, you know, being a, a, a journalist, I guess it's finally got to him and it's, uh, you know, ruined him in some level. So uh, he's at a bar when Eddie Brock goes and looks for him and then they get into a big altercation and Eddie Brock's like, you know what? I'm not going to end up like you. I'm not going to end up a washout. I'm going to go achieve my dreams. So you can kind of see Eddie Brock's kind of a star chaser. He wants fame. He wants to be recognized for his work. He wants to make a name for himself. So he's, he, again, he's, it's kind of leads into, you know, the stories we've read before about him and his flashback stories where uh, he seemed, you know, like in Dark Origin stuff where he seems someone who will cut corners to get what he wants. And at this point, he's starting to get to that. You can kind of see the beginnings of that kind of person. So again, you know, all this is, is, is neat stuff and it's it's all character uh, driven to an extent and, uh, and it's all things that are in keeping with kind of the versions of Eddie that I've always gone back to, which is like, all right, he's a guy who's you know, willing to cut corners and he, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have that straight moral compass. He lives in a very gray area and he'll do what he can to, you know, get ahead or whatever. Um, but, uh, but it, you know, kind of backfires in this book a little bit, but also it's kind of like Eddie Brock getting what he wanted and it being like a terrifying thing. So Eddie Brock goes and he, you know, hunts down, there's all these ads. It's so funny, these nineties ads. Uh, but he goes down, he actually runs into Crowbot. He goes to where uh, the, the uh, anonymous call came from and he finds out where it is off the highway and he goes and meets Crowbot. And at this point, Crowbot's telling him, like, you know, Crowbot's acting very different. He's not he's telling people, hey, look out, you could hurt yourself, like he did with Don Levy at the beginning. Now he's full on, like, eating people and, th and hurting people and throwing cars at people. And Eddie shows up and it's like, oh, we're going to get you. And Eddie's, you know, dodging the attacks and staying ahead of him. And then he's like, wait, it's a creature from deep space. It only knows darkness. Uh, you know, I have my camera here because, you know, he has to be his own photographer when he's a journalist to try to, you know, he works for like a, you know, smaller paper than the Bugle, obviously. And, uh, and so he brings a camera with him, luckily. And he, he takes pictures, and it actually, the flashes uh, basically hurt Crowbot. 
And what they do is they make Crowbot pull back and like, you know, peel himself off of Don Levy and uh, go away. And before he does, he has this little speech about how, uh, you know, uh, a, a terrible abundance of sorrow it rests within you humans. Uh, what monstrous gods would create a race with so much buried greatness, yet curse them with souls born wounded? Uh, thank goodness I pulled the, you know, the art close so I can read it off my phone. Um, but yeah, so uh, Eddie Brock kind of gets a glimpse of where this thing came from, what it was. And then as it peels away from Don Levy, it kills itself. It admits that it's going to kill himself. And then Don Levy wakes up and says, don't you get it? That's that's why it killed itself. It's because it came here. It was an explorer from another planet. And when I opened up a rift, it thought I was inviting it here to check out our planet. Uh, and, it, and it came peacefully, you know, and it didn't want to hurt me. But once it merged with me and bonded with me, it uh, tapped into what we humans, what Freud called the id, our darkest desires, our deep consciousness uh, of evil that's in all of us. And, uh, and it found that in an infected Crowbot and it turned Crowbot into a monster because it never felt anything like that before. So don't you understand? We are the monsters here. It bonded with me, a human, and it and I am the monster. I am what polluted it and turned it evil. Uh, so it was fine. It was a, it was a peaceful being from another planet, and and just by bonding with us humans, it ruins it. Uh, and so it would rather kill itself than bring back that seed of darkness to its home planet and ruin his home planet and kill all of them or drive them all mad. So he made so Crowbot made this ultimate sacrifice. So Eddie Brock has this big story he's sitting on, and he goes and pitches it to his boss at the um, at the Daily uh, <laughs> Globe and. And his boss is not having it. And uh, I can't remember his boss's name, but they did name drop him in the uh, movie. I think in the live action movie, uh, one of the text messages or emails he got was from his boss here at the Daily Globe, this guy here. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty cool. And so Eddie tries to pitch it. The story doesn't go. He starts cracking up. And at the end, he decides to throw his lap, uh, his uh, laptop. <laughs> he, uh, he's starting to get a computer. He's like, I'm finally going to upgrade it to a computer. But this typewriter that I've had for years that I've been working with, I'm going to finally get rid of it. And you can actually see now that the t font has changed. I really love that they did this. The letterer on this did a fantastic job. Uh, the font changes from uh, from this back here where Eddie's you know, uh, narrating uh, on this page these gold letters on old paper uh, to this, which is a computer screen. And you can actually see the blacked out areas are what Eddie types here in this paragraph, but then he deletes and then retypes, and then he deletes and retypes. It's pretty cool that they did that. I actually thought that was a good way to show uh, editing, and uh, and I felt like Len Kaminsky really tackled the life of a journalist and the mind of a journalist in the storyline. I thought he did a good job telling Eddie Brock stories. The art was good. It, I know it doesn't look like a recognizable Eddie Brock to a lot of us, the way this guy is drawn, but you know, at a certain point I got used to it after reading the book. But I still thought this was really fantastic. And you can see uh, you know, Eddie saying, don't worry, one day I'm going to be famous and I'm going to strike oil, <laughs> you know, and I'm going to be rich. Um, so yeah, actually we did go through the whole book there, but that's okay. I don't think Marvel cares of me spoiling this. This is available now, I think in a, a omnibus, one of the Ven, Ven omnibuses, I believe it's going to be printed in there. And I think it's in one of the trade paperbacks that came out recently, probably, uh, the tooth and claw one. I can't remember for sure, but I think it's reprinted in one of those. So, uh, if you get a chance, pick up that trade paperback, I'll put a link to it on Amazon down below. If you want to check it out or go get it at your local comic store, it's really cool. And it will have seed of darkness in there where we went back in time and we got to see a little bit of Eddie Brock as a journalist before all the craziness and before his life really falls apart. And I really like that. It was a nice insight into the character and it's canon, you know, it's all official canon. So it's nice to go back and see what kind of guy he was um, before everything went south in his life. Uh, but I would definitely say the seeds of that, that, you know, that, that part of his life that went south are definitely planted in this book. So uh, it lives up to its title, Seed of, Seed of Darkness, for sure. So thank you guys, as always, for exploring uh, these comic books with me. I, I'll obviously, going into Season 3, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. I have, like, a big Venom statue I got back here recently. We'll probably do that in one of the first episodes. We'll, like, you know, take a look at that. Um, we'll also talk about the final movie money that it's making. It's doing really well right now in China. It's having its second weekend in China right now. And I think it's made more money than... Fantastic Beasts. I think Fantastic Beasts opened really strong in China, but not in the number one spot. I think Venom beat it, but I want to wait till the final numbers come out uh, over the weekend, over Sunday and Monday. And then once they do, we'll start getting into season three stuff. And I'm just going to dive right in. I've been trying to make other content and put other videos out there, but I noticed there hasn't been a lot of interest in them. And that's totally fine. I'm not offended by that. I, I look at that as feedback and criticism. So if something I'm doing isn't working for you guys, 
I'm here for you guys. And if you guys like when I talk about Venom stuff, then I will just pump out more Venom stuff for you and we'll get back on track. So now that this whole surgery thing and everything that's been going on has kind of passed, you know, waiting for, you know, updates and everything that we're going through, um, we'll get to that. You know, I'll, I'll take a break at that point when we get there. Uh, but for now, I'll just keep pumping out content for you guys and I hopefully you guys enjoy them. So let me know what you think of Seed of Darkness down in the comments below and we'll continue our conversation about Venom and his past down there. Thanks so much for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace. You know those big fangs that Venom has? I would imagine when he has to brush his teeth, the only things that would really do it for him would be if he goes to a car wash place, and those big things that spin around, those big brushes that brush a car. I don't know if the people working in the car wash place would feel very good about handling Venom, but if I were Venom, that's where I would go. It would be the easiest thing.